Well, hey, everybody. Um, so you're probably wondering why I'm doing this PowerPoint presentation on my channel. Um, I was supposed to do it on Atheist Edge, but unfortunately, due to, due to multiple technical difficulties, I guess you can say, for lack of a better word, uh, we were unable to do so. Uh, we tried three days in a row, not working. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do the PowerPoint presentation on this channel. Um, I've allowed Atheist Edge to take what they need out of it, if they want to do the whole thing, uh, put some bumper stuff on it, put their logo on it, and upload it to their channel after I'm done. Now, I'm going to be doing this in two parts. Um, I'm not going to be watching the live chat, so please forgive me. I'm not going to be paying attention to anything but to focus on the actual PowerPoint presentation, which I'm guessing should take anywhere between 15 minutes to maybe 20, 25 minutes. Uh, but I'm going to do it in two parts where I do the presentation first, and then I might do a Q&A after but I want that on a separate video. So if, if people want to ask me questions, perfectly fine to do so. But I think I'm gonna do the PowerPoint presentation just as one video. So anybody that wants to learn about atheism and agnosticism as understood from philosophical, uh, philosophical, oh my goodness, it has been a long day, people. From a philosophical standpoint, uh, they can go to this video and review it. And anybody that uh, they run across that says, hey, you know what? I'm really not understanding these topics. Go check out Steve's channel. He has a really good video on atheism and agnosticism. Now, uh, the PowerPoint presentation is pretty basic. I've had numerous people check it for accuracy. Uh, hopefully, there's not too many errors, if any. If there are, blame them. Uh, you, well, you can blame me, whatever. People blame me for a lot of things. Uh, but I really want this to be like the definitive go-to PowerPoint presentation because I've never really seen people in a concise video explain these terms as best understood in the literature. And this is not to, to uh, promote any agenda. This is to promote material facts, not opinion. Um, I might give some opinion on here, but I'll let you know when it's my opinion. But what I'm going to tell you is what you will find if you actually do your due diligence and research this topic. This is what you will find if you go to my uh, citation page on www.greatdebatecommunity.com. And this will be what you pretty much will find if you ask 99% of the philosophical people in the community. Um, but like I said, I, I do want to thank Atheist Edge for trying, TJ Tuttle and uh, Jim Hall. You guys are awesome. I'm sorry that there were some just too many technical problems, but I hope you guys do take this video, upload it to your, your channel and share it and get some get some uh, information out of it. So here we go. We're going to jump into it. Hopefully this works. I haven't tried it like this in a very, very long time, but what can possibly go wrong as they say, right? But uh, like I said, I'm not going to be able to see the live chat only because I'm using two monitors, one for the presentation and one for notes and, and things of that nature. So, all right, here we go. What can go wrong here? And we're starting. Actually, I will check the live chat just after I start to make sure you guys can see this. So just real quick, can you guys actually see my presentation? Oh, look at this. We got Nicholas out there and Sweet Heathen. And this, I feel like I'm doing that. Um, what was that show where they had the magic little mirror thing? Romper Room. That's what it was. You guys remember Romper Room where they're like, I see vegan atheist. I see Nicholas Souter. Eh, probably for your guys' time. All right. So can you guys see what I'm at least I'm showing? So I don't do this for absolutely nothing. I'll give you like five seconds to give me a hells yes or no, can't see crap. Anyone? Please? Lane, let's say my name. Okay, Lane Shale. Okay. Yeah, you guys see I remember Robert. You guys don't see it's being shared. Okay. Um, well, see, that's why I asked. Isn't that like smart of me? Let me try this then. Um, I've learned from my mistake over the years. How about now? Does that monitor show? If it doesn't show now, then I'm really in trouble because it's like my only way I know how to do this. There we go. All right. Whew. Oh, my goodness. All right. So presentation starting. Quiet on the set. All right. Anyways, this is um, Atheism and Agnostics. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Let me go back here. So this is uh, running really slow. Atheism and Agnosticism. What my arguments are and what they are not. And I think that it's critical that I point out that because I have so many things that I talk about on these different um, platforms that people tend to either straw man my arguments, not quite get them correct, um, or just don't understand them. And I would like people to actually understand them. They don't have to agree with me, but they, they really need at least try to understand the argument because, because these arguments are pretty decent arguments, I think, but I'm going to go through and actually explain what my arguments are. So next time you hear somebody out there saying, well, Steve thinks this, you can say, eh, well, wait, no, that's not really Steve's position. 
So what my arguments are, atheism is polysemous, is a polysemous word with multiple uses. And what I mean by that is that in philosophy, certain words like atheism can be used multiple different ways. And in order to understand what the word is being used as, you have to understand the context of the author using it, right? So if you read a paper and it's using atheism in a specific way, the author is going to let you know how he's using it most of the time, or at least it's going to default. I, from what I've read, um, it's just going to assume that atheism is a belief that God does not exist, which we'll get into. If there's any variation of that, they will tell you. Um, Burgess Jackson has a paper where he defines or uses, I should say, uh, well, actually he does define it, but he, he puts simple atheism as merely God does not exist, right? So the word is polysemous. Uh, atheism in academic literature is more commonly understood to be the belief that God does not exist. And what I mean by that is that if you take any course in these things, if you read most of the literatures, uh, almost all of it will be understood that the term atheism is used uh, as a belief that God does not exist, right? So that I think is a material fact that can be validated. That's somebody who can go look and read the material and say, oh, look, uh, this is how this source is using it. This is Stanford. This is uh, Cambridge. This is Oxford. This is um, a dozen different uh, papers that I can cite. So uh, I will argue that it is most commonly understood um, in the literature. Now, if it's commonly most understood in the general population, I have no way to validate that. That is merely my opinion on that because I talk to people in real life that are not on the computer. They seem to indicate to me when I'm talking to them, although most of them are kind of been inebriated or high on caffeine, that they also feel that that atheism is generally the belief position. Now, that's not how it is in small atheist communities, and that's not how it is online. I, I recognize that most uh, internet atheists, or at least a large percentage of them, we default to the more of the lack belief. I, I get that. Okay. Uh, atheism and theism are not a dichotomy, but are contradictories. Um, I will be getting into that further in the, the presentation. But essentially, um, a dichotomy is something we're being... Uh, it is the case or not the case. When somebody says, well, I believe that God exists or I do not believe that God exists, that is dichotomous. That is something that in classical logic must be one or the other case. However, there are other logics out there where that is not necessarily the case. This is why I personally think, again, my opinion, that when you're talking about beliefs, classical logic is probably not the best way to go because it tries to shoehorn things, and it doesn't have the granularity that you would expect to find on complicated subjects such as beliefs. This is why we have things like dosastic logic. This is why you think, have things like multi-valued logic. This is why you have things like fuzzy logic. You can shoehorn anything just about into a classical dichotomy. Either you believe or you don't believe. Uh, either it's gray or not gray. Um, either it's up or not up. However, that's not what a contradictory is. A contradictory is something where one is the case, the other is not the case. It is true, the other one must be false. They both can't be true at the same time, and they both cannot be false at the same time. And I, I, like I said, I'll, I'll get more into that in a few minutes. Um, labels should not be used, should not be pushed on other people. Uh, what I mean by that is that you have the right to use any label you want to define yourself because these are your positions. Whatever is the best explanatory thing that you want to convey to somebody for your terminology, that is what you should use. However, that does not give you the right to tell people that you are this particular theological or philosophical position and you must adhere to that. When you have people like David Silverman, who has literally has said, if you do not believe in God, you're an atheist, whether you like it or not, tough shit his words, um, then that is pushing your positions onto someone else. Now, there has been a narrative that I have done this in the past, which has never happened. Anybody who's watched me for any amount of years has never heard me say, well, you know, you're not really an atheist. You're just an agnostic. No. If they've asked me what philosophical position they have, then I will give them an explanatory thing of what they would probably more likely fall into philosophically speaking, but that's not the same as taking upon a label. They can label themselves any way they want, which I find to be strange because when they are allowed to call themselves an atheist, if they're even more what would be construed as a philosophical agnostic, but they don't allow me or other agnostics to call themselves what they would like. They say you must be an atheist regardless of shit. That is not how it works. And so my argument has been, uh, you can't be hypo hypocritical like that. You cannot say to a group of people, hey, we want you to, you know, 
think the way you want. We want you to label the way you want. We don't, we don't place value in these labels, but politically we want you to, to take this label. And if you don't, you're that label anyways. That's what I take umbrage with. So my goal is to get people to understand the usage and concepts as understood in the context of philosophy and academia. That is it. I am not here to, to convince people to be atheist. I'm not here to convince people to be agnostic. Matter of fact, if you really want to know um, my history, I probably have convinced more people to be atheist than I have any other position. However, more people nowadays just recently have actually come out more agnostic after they've looked into these things and they feel it's more comfortable in that position. That's fine. But my agenda has never been to sway somebody to change the position. My agenda has always been since day one for people to understand. That's it. And I will check the live chat in a few minutes. Just to make sure that this is still going correctly. Um, again, I've learned I've gotten halfway through something and some technical thing went wrong. And well, you know what happens. So what my arguments are not, they're not a redefining of terms. When I hear people say, well, all Steve is trying to do is redefine atheism. Well, no, I'm actually explaining the position in philosophy. Oh, theists try to redefine atheism. You know, no, that's not what theists are doing. And just because a theist is doing something does not necessarily mean it's a bad argument, right? Uh, I think there's a genetic fallacy to be had there. So I'm not redefining anything. I'm actually explaining how it's best understood in the literature. And I, again, opinion now in general, general parlance. Uh, but I can't, I can't give you proof of that. So let, let's leave that as a B. Uh, my, my arguments are not assigning labels to people. I do not go around telling people they're actually agnostic when they assign themselves to be atheist, even if they only are a lack of belief atheist. Um, I, I will just tell them, well, if you ask me what you think, what I think your position would be philosophically, that's fine. I'll tell you it, but I will not call you something that you you're not. I mean, if you want to, to, to take the lack of belief approach to atheism, fine, you're an atheist. Um, I don't have the same considerations to me though. When people have literally gone to my channel many, many, many times, many, many comments saying, Steve, you're an atheist, whether you like it or not, Steve, you don't believe in God. You are an atheist bar none. That's it. They're all there is to it. And that's where I have to explain to them that they're completely and utterly fundamentally wrong, just flat out categorically wrong because I can demonstrate that they're wrong. Uh, telling others what they believe. Uh, this is a, a, a charge that I find to be very odd. When I explain to somebody that as best understood in philosophy, that atheism is the belief that God does not exist, that does not mean I am telling them what they believe. The weirdest argument or counter argument that I've had is when somebody says, well, I'm an atheist. I do not believe. And you're telling me now that because I'm an atheist, I believe. Well, no. And that does not follow. I'm not telling them what they believe. I'm telling them how the position is held in philosophy. And for some strange reason, they have a disconnect there. I do not know why. I've tried to figure it out. I cannot do it. So if you can help me later on in the Q&A, help me explain to me while some, why somebody would say that I'm telling what they believe when I'm clearly telling them what they're, that they're, you know, not, um, they're not obligated to believe that. It's just that if you're going to be reading the literature, this is how you would best understand the word, or you're, you're not going to be reading the paper very well. Uh, evaluating not believe P with believing P is false. Uh, again, I hear we this weird narrative that I'm going around telling people, well, if you don't believe in God, that means you believe God does not exist. No, that is not how it logically follows. I have never made that argument. I would never make such an argument. That is just a ridiculous argument. I've explained to people sometimes if I think that they can understand it, there is something called negation raising where you say in a speech act type of thing, where you say, I do not think this is the case, where somebody might interpret it, which I, I think is more of a perlocutionary act, that they might infer that to be, I think it to be the case. An example would be, Steve, are you going to the party? And I say, eh, I don't think I'm going to go. To most people, they're going to take that. They're going to, they're going to raise that. They're going to elevate that from do not believe to believe or do not think to think. That's why it's called negation raising. You're negating now. And they're going to say, well, you know what? Steve says he's, he doesn't think he's going to go. And they're going to take that. It means Steve's not going. They, they think that that is one way of expressing that. But that's not how it is in logic. If you say, I do not believe aliens exist, that is not saying that you believe that they don't. Right? So it's really strange when people say that that's my argument. It's not. Uh, my arguments are not theistic arguments. I have no idea when people sit there and tell me, well, Steve, 
you sound like a theist. You're a closet theist. You're arguing like a theist. Well, no, um, I'm not a theist. Uh, I'm not arguing like a theist. I'm arguing with reason, logic, and evidence. Uh, some theists will do that. Some theists won't. But what I say is no way ever going to be logically somebody who could say that I told a theist position. I don't believe that gods exist. Therefore, how can I be a theist in any meaningful way, in any cognitive way, right? So my goal is to prevent people from arguing I believe things that I do not and or arguing against positions that I do not hold. Um, I'm going to take a quick uh, step here real quick. I'm going to pause. I'm going to look to see if uh, everything's going okay and check the live chat if I may. Of course, things. Is, well, it's going slow. Uh, there we go. No. Okay, I'm going to have to stop sharing for a second. So notice the stop there. There you go. But I'm streaming, so my computer's running very slow. So please bear with me for a second. It's actually shut off my other monitor. Uh oh. Okay, there we go. Uh, so let me check the shop uh, to chat here, guys. Uh, all good from Nicholas. Uh, okay, well, that's all I need to know. Thank you. Uh, going back to the presentation. Oh, thank you, sir, uh, Christian Sardin. I, I saw that super chat before I turned it off. Thank you. Um, I'll get to that at the uh, end here. My evidence consists of academic and philosophical citations, including Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Cambridge, Oxford, and experts in their field. Uh, I literally have a whole list of citations on my, my uh, domain, which is www.greatdebatecommunity.com. Now, my whole argument does not come from Stanford. Stanford is a very good to go to source. It is bar none the only thing that I use nor do I claim it's definitive. However, it is considered to be one of the more gold standards. Uh, and to promote a friend of mine, Dr. Paul Draper, who wrote the article Atheism on uh, Stanford Encyclopedia, was just on Dr. Alex Malpass's channel. Uh, I haven't got a chance to watch that whole hangout yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, he would appreciate that. Uh, I'm, call, I, I'm, I'm letting you guys know that I, I love his, his page on that. And uh, I think he did a wonderful job in writing that page, Atheism for Stanford. And yet it's so funny because I still have people tell me, well, Steve, that page from Atheism was written by an atheist. And let me assure you, Dr. Paul Draper is not a theist. And if you go watch um, uh, that hangout, I'm sure that you'll get the impression that he is definitely an atheist because he's arguing atheist arguments. So I find that to be odd. When people say that, oh, well, that's just a theist argument coming from SEP. Um, my evidence consists of logical reasoning. Um, this is why I do use um, predicate logic. It's very simple predicate logic, uh, nothing really extreme, but it does show that there's a coherency, there's a consistency, there's a there's a way to look at the stuff that is logically valid. And that, I think, I don't see from other people. I have asked people, will you please show me your logic? And I never, well vast majority of the time i never get a logical argument and they, they say my logic is wrong well if the logic is wrong you should be able to demonstrate the logic is wrong uh logic is one of those things that's not subjective it is objective and so i run my some proofs through a logical proof checker um, i run it through other people that are experts in these topics if you think that we are wrong on these things please let us know but you, the only way you're going to demonstrate that is by showing that the argument is wrong by using logic um, I use a reductio ad absurdum, which I'll get into. I use rational argumentation, which I'll get into. Uh, goal, to provide supportive evidence for my position from peer-reviewed and scholarly, scholarly philosophical sources based upon validatable facts, not merely my opinion. This is critical. While I do inject my opinion many times, I usually try to tell people these are my opinions and I can only... I can only give you so much evidence for those opinions. But there are material facts of the matter. Material facts, I do not think are subjective. I think they are objective. I think that they could be gone and looked at by anybody because they're accessible to anybody. When we talk about objectivity in, in philosophy, it is not the same as objective in science. So objective in science means just without bias, that two people can look at something from different frames of references and objectively come to the same conclusion. That's not how it is in philosophy. Philosophy would be more two people have access to a material fact of some kind something that is ontologically the case, 
and have ex have the ability to 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 evaluate that. For example, um, if I have a toothache, that is subjective. You cannot step into my head and evaluate my pain, right? That there's no fact of the matter to be had for you to do that. But if I say, let's get play a game of chess and we look at the rules and the rules are objectively there for us to both be uh, evaluating and, and see that there's an objective fact of the matter there, that is objective. So chess is an objective game. People can say, well, you can change the rules of chess, but yes, but that's not ch playing chess then. That's playing a variation of chess. So atheism is polysemous as many definitions used uh, in philosophy and different ways it can be expressed. These are not in any particular order. However, the, the top two are the most common. First one, the proposition that God does not exist. You can find this in Stanford, 2017 by Paul Draper. The belief that God does not exist. You can find this in the Oxford Dictionary of Atheism. The negation of theism. This is an older version of Stanford Encyclopedia. This was from a, a philosopher named J.J.C. Smart. There's there's some some issues that might be had with that particular definition uh, because you're not really negation you're not really negating theism. What you're doing or the belief of theism. What you're doing is you're, you're negating the proposition. I think it would be cl more clear to say it is the negation of the proposition. Of theism and i wish he would have worded that way he would have saved me a lot of heartache with the phd student i know that is a math that i've gone back and forth with on this because he's not entirely wrong um, but i think that it would be a lot more clear if, if the, he just would have said the negation of the proposition of theism uh the denial of the existence of god this would be martin 1998 denial here if you read the context is the belief that god does not exist not just merely not believing uh, the lack of belief that God exists, uh, Ibid, Martin also uses that terminology as well. The disbelief or denial that God exists, this is also Draper, but Draper's using disbelief in the context of, I believe that the proposition is false, um, or denial of the God existence, uh, which he's referring to as, I deny the proposition to be true, I accept the proposition to be false. This is how Draper's using it. And then there's one odd one that you'll find if you read SEP or IEP, which was by Professor McCormick. Uh, there is a way to define atheism as metaphysical naturalism. Uh, I reject that particular definition uh, because I just don't think it makes sense to do so. Um, I do agree, however, if you do adhere to metaphysical naturalism, then to have a rational framework, you also must be a atheist that believes that no God does not exist. I'm not going to get into that argument in this presentation. That argument's out there. Um, you can find it. But it, it's very simple. If you don't believe... So if you have the belief that all is natural, then there cannot be a supernatural God. And if you want to argue there's a natural God, fine, whatever. But that to me is just semantics at that point. Because if you have to, to argue that God is natural, then you need to tell me the difference between a natural pencil and a, uh, a non-natural pencil, right? If you say, well, this God is, you know, the sun is my God. Okay, well, what's the difference between a sun that's a God and a sun that's not a God? If there's no distinction between the two to be had, if there's no delimination between the two, then it's just a semantic issue at that point. There's no material fact to be had that changes one to the other. So the most common usage, uh, Cambridge, This is these are all quotes. You can go check these out. Like I said, I do cite my sources. Cambridge says, a stricter sense denotes a belief that there is no God. This use has become the standard one. Uh, to me, that's very clear, that this is the standard use that's understood uh, that uh, that when you say the word atheist, it is the belief that God does not exist. Oxford says, belief that there is no God or gods, arguably the most popular and current usage. This I agree with. This is why it's arguably. Um, there's really no way to determine this, I think. I mean, you would have to take a really deep census to determine how the general usage of the population uses it. However, I think it's the case because I've talked to people and if you really dive deep in it, I think that everywhere I've ever read, in, in even standard literature, this is how that term is actually used. So Stanford says, therefore, in philosophy at least, atheism should be construed as a proposition that God does not exist, or more broadly, that the proposition that there are no gods. This is a very telling statement. This is saying that, at least in philosophy, and you can argue, well, what else could they possibly mean with atheism? Atheism is always a philosophical, uh, philosophical term, which I do believe the case is. Agnosticism, not so much, but um, but at least in philosophy, that atheism should be construed as a proposition that God does not exist. Now, this 
goes against the narrative that I've seen put out where, no, atheism cannot be the belief that God does not exist, or at least that is not what is intended to be. That anybody who uses the belief understanding is straw manning atheism, or they're, they're uh, putting forth a theistic position. Because theists do usually explain this, but they're not wrong on that. Don't be afraid to give credit where credit is due if the data backs them. Because if you argue against somebody that has the evidence, all you're going to do is make your other arguments look weak. And I and it's, it's sad because it shouldn't have any effect on that, but it does. However, I just got a message and it may be somebody telling me that um, things have gone wrong. So I'm going to check this real quick. Um, but I'm not going to show it. So I got to stop being sure. But my monitor keeps timing out for some reason, uh, my secondary monitor, which is bugging me because I got to wait for it to kick back on every time I time out. I hope nobody messaged me out for no reason here. But give me a second. It's really not working too well. But I don't want to tab real quick because I don't want to see the message. Come on. Oh. Let me get the live chat. Can I at least get the live chat? Oh. One sec. Okay, there we go. I'm um, sorry, it's so slow, guys. Um, oh, wait, uh, I need to stop screen sharing. Okay, screen share that, and then I'm gonna stop screen sharing just to make sure. Uh, am I screen sharing now? I'm, I shouldn't be, right? Oh, the PowerPoint has been gone for a while. So, where where did it leave off? Oh, it did, it didn't come back. Have you checked chat? Really? Oh man. All right. Well, let me um, let me do this real quick. Uh, I'm going to screen share, but I'm actually going to have the the, the uh, chat up while I do this, so I can see what's going on. Uh, that's the chat. You guys should be able to see that. And I'll just run through these things real quick. Um, so let me go to the presentation. The advantage of having two monitors here. All right, so I got the I got the thing up. So can you guys see this now? I'm going to put this over here, maybe. Hey, okay, okay. So we're, I'm just going to scroll through this real quick um, so you guys can see what I had up here. Okay, so I went through the evidence, what my evidence consists of, um, what my arguments are on. Oop, let me go back here. All right, I think I went too far. Here we go. All right, I'm going to leave the chat up here so that's okay. You guys can actually see it since I'm screen sharing it. So, or I might move it to the other screen. All right, so here we go. Um, atheism of polysemus, and these are the reasons why. You can check these, um, these uh, sources at your own convenience, okay? Uh, this is Cambridge, Oxford, Stanford, and I think that's where we left off. Good to go? Awesome. All uh, right. Anthony Flew said that in his paper, Presumption of Atheism, in 1972, which kind of started this whole movement of lack of belief atheism, uh, he even said, and this is kind of strange because people actually cite Flew, and this is how I know that they never read the paper, which I've read multiple times. In the very first page or two, he says a couple of very interesting things, one of which he says, quote, whereas nowadays the usual meaning of atheist in English is someone who asserts that there is no such being as God. I want to change. I want the word to be understood not positively, but negatively, which is why we get the negative definition. You know, the negative atheism versus positive atheism. Positive atheism is a position that God does not exist. Negative atheism is a position that you just don't believe, with one exception: the ACA, the American, or excuse me, the um, Atheist Community of Austin, for some reason, which they're allowed to do, they have repurposed the term positive atheism to mean just a positive spin, a happy face of atheism. When they say that they promote positive atheism, they are not saying that they promote the belief that God does not exist. They're promoting a happy, positive view of atheism. Um, I understand that distinction. I don't know if other people do, 
but hope they do not. I uh, um, hope they don't get the, them confused, right? I hope they don't go on an ACA page and say, oh, look, they're promoting positive atheism. They're saying atheism is the belief that God does not exist. No, that's not what they're doing. So I do not want to straw man them. Um, he also said the introduction of new interpretation of the word atheism may appear to be a piece of perverse Humpty Dumptyism. Um, we're just kind of piecing things together, going arbitrarily against the established com common usage. Um, and I think that it is in some ways. Uh, I think that uh, even Flu didn't really believe this argument very much. He became a deist later on in life. Some people may argue that he uh, had dementia, possible. But uh, there was a very good paper that was out in 2017. And this paper was by Jackson that just obliterated his argumentation for a presumption of atheism. And uh, I don't want to go into too much detail about the paper, but his argument was basically along the lines that for a convict, or excuse me, not a convict, but a person on trial, uh, we have a presumption of atheism. Or some, God, we have a presumption of innocence for them. And that the default is that the burden of proof is on the prosecutor. If the prosecutor does not meet their burden of proof, then the 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 innocent the, the person's not found innocent, but he's he's gone free, right? And the the narrative was flu and other organizations tried to say, well, if theists don't make their burden of proof, um, then you know we don't believe them. I find this to be egregious in my personal opinion. Again, telling you my opinion. That is not how argumentation theory works when it comes to this. When you have a dialectic, both people come to the table with positions and both of them have a burden of proof, whether you agree or disagree, both those positions have a burden of proof. So when you try to say only the theist has the burden of proof, that, that to me is burden shifting because the only reason that we assigned the true burden of proof to the theist in this particular case is because we define theism to be the belief that God does not exist. If we would define it differently, if we would define atheism as the belief that God does not exist, we would reverse it. And then the presumption would be you're a theist rather than an atheist. Perfectly logically viable to do that. It's called mirroring. So the problem with the, that Ber Jackson, um, Burgess Jackson pointed out is that the reason we have presumption of atheism uh, presumption of, ign of, of, of innocence is that there are four different positions you can have when it comes to judicial systems. You can have a innocent person that's found guilty. That's considered to be a travesty adjustment, right? They call it an infelicity of just justice. You can have a innocent person that's gone free, which is the way we would want it to be. You can have a guilty person who can go free, which is a injustice or infelicity of justice or you have a guilty person go to jail two of those are judicial errors two of them are not so it's balanced but we have a society at least in america that we find it to be more egregious an error for an innocent man to go to jail than a guilty man to go free i support that system this is why we have the presumption of innocence in the court of law when it comes to atheism, there's no such reason to have such a presuppos presupposition. There's no such travesty of justice. There's no such narrative where if you are wrong, there is a injustice to be had. Nor is there something along the lines of a speedy trial, right? You can take as much time as you like to determine whether you believe God exists or not, or that you have a whole belief that God exists, or that the belief that God does not exist. Matter of fact, if you really want to get down to, to to detail the theist might actually argue well there is a necessity because if you don't believe you're going to hell i think that's a shitty argument but um, the atheist has no bearing to say uh hey look at you really need to make a decision right because there's no consequences if you guess wrong to an atheist there's no judicial error and i think that was a brilliant refutation of flu's argument by jackson all right moving on I'm having to keep switch to this, so that's why you see me tabbing there. Um, logical consistency. Given the proposition that P equals God exists, or P equals at least one of God exists or existed, um, some people have tried to point out, well, if you say existed, what about a deist? Or exist? what about a deist? A, a God that created the universe and died or disappeared or went away. Um, I'm going to go be through a time. Look, at, there's no tense here as far as temporal. If a God existed and you believe that a God existed at one time for this argument, um, you're, you're a theist. Okay. Um, you can, you can preface these, these propositions any way you want, but the problem is, is when I'm typing this stuff out on things like Twitter, where you have hundred or 280 characters, 
Um, I try to make it short as possible. So I'm just going to go with God exists most of the time. It's very it's simplistic. And I think most people have been around long enough to know that the proposition of theism is that you believe God exists. So, so the way it would work is this. When you see BP, that means a belief predicate with a proposition of theism, which is God exists. So BP means believes P or believe that God exists, which is theism, right? Believe tilde P, which is a not symbol. So when you see that B tilde P, what that means is believes the negation of the proposition, which is believes the proposition is false, which is atheism. Again, how I'm explaining it from a philosophical standpoint. This is a material fact. This is not a, 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 a my opinion. This is something that anybody can go look at. When they say that, when they say what Steve is wrong about this, they're fundamentally wrong because this is something that is conclusive. Uh, so an agnostic would hold to this position, not BP and not B, not P. Now that looks terrifying to some people. I get that, right? I understand that if you've never had logic or math, you may not get that. But let me break it down to you because it's not as complicated as you think it is. If if tilde means not, and belief B means belief, and P means God exists, run it together. What do you get? Not believes God exists, right? Now you could put an indexical indexical on there and say, well, I do not believe God exists, and I'm okay with that. Now a logistician might call you out on that, right? Because there is no index in, in indexicality there. Sometimes you might see it written, written as B A P, which is the agent believes P. You might see it written as B S P which is subject believes P that is indexical, right? As the I or the agent or this something along those lines, but I am not going to be that much of a pendant with this. If I see not BP, I'm going to go ahead and say, I don't believe that God exists. Somebody else, like I said, might call you out for that, whatever. Um, that little carrot symbol, the, the little tent, all that means is, and right. And the way the easiest way to think about it is that it's like an A, right? It looks kind of like an A doesn't have the horizontal bar, but it looks kind of like an A. It's a symbol for and, um, not B, not P. So that would stand for not believe, not P. I So that would be all read together. Does not believe the proposition God exists, does not, and does not believe the proposition God does not exist. So this is somebody who says, hey, look at, I do not believe that God exists, and I do not believe that God does not exist. It is somebody who's on the fence of this. This would be equivalent to saying, if you are given the, the proposition, there are even number of gumballs, well, I would say that I do not believe that they're even, and I do not believe that they're odd. I'm agnostic on that because I don't have any way to determine um, justification-wise of how I would go about justifying holding a belief either way. It is about the justification of it. If I was to say, I believe that these gumballs are odd, are odd I need a reason for this to hold that position rationally. When we talk about justification, it means that we are justified to hold a rational position because there's reasons for it. If there's if there's just a 50-50 chance that it might be even or it might be odd, and we're assuming some kind of quantized state here, whole gumballs and stuff like that, and there's some countable number, then there is some fact of the matter to be had. But since I have absolutely no evidence one way or the other, I cannot have any justification one way or another, the only the rational position to me in that particular case is to hold to the position of being agnostic on the proposition, right? So, so, um, uh, you know what? I forgot the tilde here. Somebody who proofread this made a mistake here. There should be a tilde here, tilde BP and uh, tilde not BP is set up to here. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. My proofreaders, I forgive you. This is my fault. I am sorry. Um, so BP and B not P is set up here is not as a dichotomy. What this means is that theism and atheism is, is set up here, not as a dichotomy, but as contradictory, such as if theism is true, then atheism is false. Both cannot be true and both cannot be false. Uh, let me explain this real quick, if I may. And I think I, I think I have a slide on here, so I might be double covering this. Uh, if ontologically, right. Yeah, people in the live chat, they know who they know some of the people that read this and proofread it, uh, which they did a wonderful job. Excellent. Uh, it, ontologically, which is being being right. Um, it is the case of God does not exist or God does exist, right? Yeah, you can't work, you pay for it. Thank you, sweet heathen. Uh, true. 
if you if you look at the universe and you say, look at, uh, I believe God exists. You're, you are actually just saying that you think it is the case that it, more likely God exists because there can only be two ontological states. It is the case that God exists or it is not the case that God exists. Um, so it, if, it's, if it is the case that God exists, then the theist is correct. Right? The theist believes that they got it right. But if you believe that there are no gods, Right. If you actually say, look at, I think that is, is the case that God does not exist and God does not exist. You got it right. But both of you cannot be correct. An atheist and a theist can, can, they both cannot be right at the same time. They are contradictories. If one is true, the other must be false. Both cannot be true and both cannot be false. One must be the case. Moving on. Oh, you know what? You click there. There we go. Now moving on. Um, and I might want to point out, because I don't think I put it in here, just in case, there are something called contraries. Contraries are positions where one is true, the other is false. They both cannot be true, but they both can be false. Let me give you an example. If I was to say, um, um, let's say Judaism and Christianity, right? Those are religious positions. Those are theistic and atheist, both theistic positions, correct? But Christianity can, it cannot be true at the same time as Judaism can be true. If one is true, the other one has to be false. Either Christ was who he said he was, or he wasn't, right? He was either the you know son of God or God, but he was or he wasn't. However, they both can be false. It could be the case that um, Judaism is just completely wrong. Uh, there is no Yahweh. It could be the case that Christianity is wrong. You know, there could be no Christ or, or Yahweh. So both of them could be wrong, but they both cannot be true at the same time, right? So that's what's called a contrary. So let me explain the difference between a dichotomy and a contradictory. This is very critical because I think a lot of people, when they look at a dichotomy, they they they, they do not understand what these, these terms mean when you're talking about something that is jointly exhaustive and mutually exclusive. So a dichotomy must be this in logic. One, jointly exhaustive. All members must be, must be in either one set or the other. For example, uh, it is the case that my car is red, or it is not the case that my car is red. So if it is in a set of things that are all things red, my car is going to be in that set. However, if my car is not red, it will not be in that set. It'll be in the set of things that are not red. There are only two possible sets. They are jointly exhaustive. It must be in one set, and it must be or either that or in the other set. Um, you must be sweet heathen or you must not be sweet heathen, right? There, any, anything that is sweet heathen is in one set. Anything that's not sweet heathen is in that other set. There is no other option. So it's jointly exhaustive. They're also mutually exclusive. No member can be in both sets, right? So if my car is red, it cannot be simultaneously in the set of all things red and the set of things that are not red, right? Now, of course, somebody's going to point out, well, what if it's this color or that color? It doesn't matter. Uh, it is the case that it's red or it's not red. There is no fuzzy logic to be had here in classical logic. Um, if you want to make it more of a quantized state, either the electrons spin up or the electrons spin down. There are no other options, correct? Okay, so they're mutually exclusive. Now everybody's going to be a sweet heathen. See what I started? Uh, you know what's funny is people are going to watch this video on Atheistic Edge and they're going to be going, who the heck are these people that he's talking about that are in my live chat? But that doesn't give them a reason to come over and watch my videos. Uh, a, so when you say a V or not a V or not uh, tilde a, that V means, or, and what my, they mean by that is it is one or the other, uh, a or not a means something is either a, or it's not a, it cannot be any other case. This is called the law of excluded middle. So if you instantiate that, which means to put something in place of that, if you instantiate that with theist, right? So I have theist or not theist. That is a dichotomy. There are no other options. Again, classical logic. Now, I will give one quick caveat here. That when you're dealing with dosastic logic, this does not hold. Okay? This is why I emphasize that I believe that dosastic logic and certain other logics have more granularity. A theological non-cognitivist, which I'll get into in a little while here, does not meet any of those criteria. They are not a theist, nor are they not theist. That is a very difficult concept to wrap your head around. It took me a while myself 
but I had very smart people educate me on this and I finally got it through my head. This was years ago, by the way. Uh, but I really, it, it was really hard for me to, to, to change my mindset from a classical approach to dosastic. So a theological and cognitivist, this violates this because that doesn't hold in classical logic. You can pigeon that hold them. You can shove them into that non-theist position. But by doing that, you lose the nuance of what a theological not cognitivist actually holds to, right? So uh, ontological dichotomy. This would be, again, in the physical universe, it is the case that God exists or it is not the case that God exists. There are no other options. Um, but a dostastic dichotomy is believes God exists or does not believe God exists. Again, no other options. You either believe or you do not believe. Now, I'm told this all the time. This is what I think is rather strange to hear. When I hear people tell me, like literally daily, to the got to the point where I wrote a blog on this particular um, argument, that I'm told this at least once a day, or he was at the time once a day. Well, Steve, either you believe or you don't believe. Well, yeah, I know this. Okay, I'm in, I'm more than well aware of this. That's not a counter argument. I've, I've said it all along. So it's it's strange when I hear people argue that to me as somehow defeated in my arguments. Next slide. Uh, benefits of having a contradictory, right? This is going to be an argument more for utility, right? Why do we have things the way they are in philosophy? What practical purpose does it have? I do understand that there are maybe reasons why people might take an atheist in the, in the more sensulato or general definitions because of political reasons, right? They want as many people to have that title to gain more membership, right? To gain political power. Um, it is a utility argument. I understand that. It's kind of an argument from consequence because in order to do so, you have to take aboard a lot of baggage, which I'll show you. But let me show you why I think that is a bad approach. Uh, so the benefits would be it allows for two different direct answers to the question, does God exist? Uh, a direct question is something you can answer yes or no. Okay. Now, does that mean you don't, you have to? No. Does that mean there are not indirect answers? No, there are many indirect answers. But if you really want to get to the heart of the matter of what somebody's actual beliefs are, right? Not, not what they do not believe, but what they believe, this is a wonderful question to ask. Matter of fact, this has been the great debate question for thousands of years. I wrote a flow chart one time, and this was the first question I asked. And I had somebody in the ACA just basically call me out by saying, well, Steve never should have asked that question first. They should, he sort of started, started it propositionally. I thoroughly disagree. As a matter of fact, when, when I'm asking philosophers about this, why would they have me start this from a philosophical um, proposition, which I can get to after this question, when this question solves it out right off, solves it right off the bat. It tells you exactly what you are if you can answer yes or no. They were at a loss too. So I do not know the counter argument why this is a bad question. So if you answer yes to this, you're a theist. Find me somebody that disagrees with that, and we're going to have some major issues because I don't I don't know why you would think for a second that if you believe God exists, you're not a theist. But whatever. Um, but again, this is going from a philosophical standpoint. Uh, no, you're an atheist, right? If you does God exist, you say no. You're making a claim that there is no God, right? So if you if you make the claim that there are no gods, it means that you believe that there are no gods. That's an atheist, right? You're, you're, you can't say to somebody, well, you believe God does not exist. Ergo, you're not an atheist. That would make no sense. Um, so this actually tells somebody right off the bat that you're a theist or an atheist. But I don't know. I don't care what is God or all ac acceptable indirect answers. I don't know here, however, is expressing ordinary doubt as uh, unable to weigh into the argument or weigh into the question. It's not lacking knowledge in the epistemological sense. When I say I don't know, that is not saying that I don't have um, epistemological knowledge, which is going to get into things like, you know, justified true belief and theories of knowledge. What it's saying is I have ordinary doubt. I just, I don't have enough information, right? Not knowledge in that sense of the word, but information. I don't have enough information to properly evaluate the proposition in order to which to say it is true or false. So I don't know. Uh, gumballs would be a perfect answer. If I say, look it, if, or for example, if I would say uh, the proposition that the gumballs are odd, I don't know if that proposition is true, and I don't know if that proposition is false. I have to remain agnostic on that proposition because I don't have enough information to justify me holding a belief either way. That's what agnostic on P means. Agnosticism, 
Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is a psychological position of holding to the position of agnostic on the proposition, where agnostic would mean you don't believe it's true and you don't believe it's false. So if God exists, then theism is true. If God does not exist, then atheism is false. Very simple. This very, very simple. Um, maintain, and I like this one the most. This one's not really talked about that much. And if you go to Dr. Alex Malpass's use of reason, he really explains this concept really well, much better than I could ever hope to. So I'm not going to get into it too much. But if you go to his blog, please do. But what it does, it maintains the is to ism relationship. Theist accept theism is true, and atheism is false. And atheist accept atheism is true, and accept theism is false. The reason why this works to say atheism is true is because ontologically, if God does not exist and you believe that God does not exist, then you can say that that proposition, God does not exist, is true, right? So there is a proposition to be had there. It's just the, the negation of the proposition of theism. If the proposition of theism is God exists, the negation of that is God does not exist. Now, some people may tell you whether negation is no is God is not God exists. That's not how it works with the negation. I challenge you to find a logician, a logician that accepts that. That's not how it works. The negation of the proposition is the proposition of the self, not the belief. So if the proposition, remember, is P, God exists, negating that, not God exists, right? Or God does not exist, then you throw the belief predicate on. I believe God does not exist. So this maintains a very nice dichotomy there um, of, well, not even dichotomy, I shouldn't say dichotomy. This makes a much better relationship. So if you say, I'm an atheist, it means you hold that the proposition of atheism is true. It also means there's a substantive matter to a fact to be had there. If you think that atheism is merely a lack of belief, then what would it mean to say, yeah, atheism is true? That makes no sense, right? It makes no sense to say, <laughs> I, I, I do not believe is something that can be true. That's not truth apt, right? There's no proposition to be had there. It, the worst case would be, well, are you saying that if I do not believe God exists? Well, that's a proposition, sure. But that's only saying that I hold that position. That is true that I hold that proposition. It has no effect on ontology, right? It has no effect on, on states of affairs. It, well, I guess you could argue, well, your beliefs are state of affairs, but that's not how I'm using these terms. But it's a different proposition. So if the proposition is, I do not believe God exists, that statement is either true or false. And that statement in this case is true. I do not believe God exists. But that's why we don't define it in the, in the negative in, in philosophy the way people have been going around saying for years. And it wasn't until many people came along who knew about these topics and said, whoa, wait a minute here. You guys are putting out information and you're not giving the full amount of the information. You're giving a narrative that for your agenda but you're not giving it how it is in academia. And if you go to study these topics, you go to take these courses, that is not how you're going to be learning these topics. You're not going to do well on them. So next, boy, this is taking a lot longer than I expected. My apologies. Whew. Uh, so do you believe that God exists? That's the question we really want to know, right? When we're talking about these topics, do you really want to know what somebody doesn't believe? If I say, hey, um, Kiwasa, what do you want for dinner? And you say, eh, well, I don't want chicken. You're not really telling me anything informative, right? I don't really care what you don't want as much as I want to know what you do want. This is why we talk about people's beliefs. This is why we want to know why people have weird beliefs, right? Oh, well, wait a minute. You believe that uh, rocks can heal you, right? We don't care if they don't believe that rocks can heal you or not. We want to know why, why you think rocks can heal you, right? Because they're the beliefs that we're talking about. Um, so belief here is not the psychological belief, but the belief that proposition God exists is true or false. And the reason why we do this is because psychological beliefs cannot be tested by argumentation. Typically in philosophy, to use the suffix ism is to refer to a proposition instead of a state or condition, such uh, since only the former can be sensibly tested by argumentation, SEP Paul Draper. And what he means by this is that if you think that atheism is the case, that God does not exist, that is something that we can argue, right? I cannot argue your psychological belief. So if you just say, say that atheism is the psychological belief, I can't argue that because agnosticism is a psychological belief. As I mentioned a few slides ago, agnosticism is the psychological belief of holding to agnostic on the proposition. That is not something that can be argued. What can be argued is your justification 
we're holding to agnosticism. And it wasn't until very recently, and I don't remember your name, please forgive me, but somebody took the time to ask me, Steve, why are you justified to hold to agnosticism? And this was on Facebook. And I wrote a, a, a solid paragraph on the reasons why. And they said that basically that was the best explanation of why I was agnostic they've ever heard. And they're going to use that in, for reasoning why they hold to agnosticism. And if somebody for the same reason could hold a weak atheism. I don't remember exactly what I wrote. Please forgive me. I didn't prepare for that for this presentation. But there, there is a position to be held when you say I'm agnostic. It is the position that I do not believe either way. Why you hold that position is something we can talk about, right? But um, answers, yes, BP for theist. No, for not BP as not theist is a dichotomy, right? So if you say, do you believe God exists? And you say, yes, you're a theist. But if you answer no, that just merely means not theist. This goes back to being a dichotomy, right? Theist or not theist. It is the case you're a theist or it is not the case you're a theist. So if you do not believe God exists, you're not theist. This is logic, right? So this is all logically coherent. This is the dichotomy of believes P and not believes P. So if you want to take that and say, well, not theist is an atheist. Anybody who does not believe his God is an atheist. All you're really doing, and this is a semantic argument uh, and at this point, not mine, but the atheist who do this, that the words not theist now mean atheist. So they're, they're, uh, they're interchangeable. And this is a problem because it creates many instantiation issues. It creates many absurdities. It creates um, what's called an intentionality problem because they're not the interchangeable. They have uh, differences in, in how they're interpreted. And so when you're doing that, it creates a lot of problems. And I think that to avoid those issues, I do not use that lax type of terminology. That's why you don't find it that way in philosophy because who wants to have Confusion. Who wants to have absurdities? Who wants to have contradictions? Uh oh, um, somebody just messaged me, and I'm sorry. You're gonna have to type in the live chat because I can't get to you. Um, I'm not gonna stop the presentation for that. So is my presentation still going in the live chat? Because I just heard somebody message me, but uh, I'm unavailable. And I don't want. I don't want to show private messages. I don't do that. All right. So moving on. Uh, answering no can only tell someone by deductive inference that the person is not a theist. There's no logical entailment that allows for deduct by deductive inference that the person, you know, I said that, that there, somebody missed that one. That's on them, not me. Uh, a person is an atheist since they may hold to atheism as the belief God does not exist and not hold that belief condition. Oh, oh that messes me hard now. Should I check this, guys? Uh, I really don't want to. So if you can hear me there, type in the live chat. Uh so what this means is that uh, if I answer no to that question, do you believe God exists? There's no possible way by using logic, by deductive inference, that you can tell somebody's an, an atheist or not. They might not hold to that position. They may not hold. They may hold to an agnostic position. They might just say, "I do not believe either way." So if they use the, what's called sensu lato definitions, then that's fine. But if they hold what's called sensu stricto, it is not the case. So merely answering no to this question, do you believe God exists, does not by necessity, does not by entailment constitute a sufficient condition to say somebody is, is an atheist. That is a logical fact. There's a fact of the matter to be had there that logically that is the case. The only time that can hold logically is if you hold to the paradigm that atheism is not theist, which I will accept is to be a logical deductive inference. However, since that is not ubiquitous, that is not always the case, then there are situations where this does not hold, therefore the logic does not hold. So if I go to somebody and say, do you believe that God exists? And they say, no, the most I can say about that person is that they're not theist by using logic. That's it. By using logic, that's the best condition I can get. All right, so moving on here. Um, agnosticism three ways. This is right out of my blog. Um, however, the main source for this is SEP, um, but I didn't copy this from SEP. I got it from basically um, their explanations, right? So number one, agnosticism in the most broadest sense was Thomas Huxley's view of a normative epistemological principle or method similar to evidentialism or even logical positivism. 
positivism, which was one should not believe anything that cannot be validated, observed, learned by experiment, or proportionally determined to be true or false, etc., or according to Huxley, that one has no justification to claim knowledge or even belief that gods do not exist. This is a rather archaic meaning. You don't see it used that much. The reason being is because I do not think that his method was uh, was the way to go. I think it had issues. I think that logical positivism is logical positivism. Logical positivism has issues. I think that verification has issues because verificationism is self refuting. Because how do you verify something? How does ver verification is something that you need to verify? Well, how do you verify verificationism? That's circular. And logical positivism was the position that nothing is cognitively meaningful unless it can be shown to be true or false. Eh, that presents a problem, right? Because not everything's that case. But this is how Huxley kind of came to this normative epistemological principle. And there are still people that hold to this. You might know them on Twitter. There's, there's an agnostic that wholly or highly believes in this. I'm not a Huxley agnostic. But number two, agnosticism as epistemological proposition. This is the proposition that God's, the pro knowledge of God is unknowable, sometimes referred to as strong agnosticism. It is also can be referred to as weak agnosticism if you don't think that proposition is true. So if the proposition is P, does, uh, knowledge of God is knowable, that's either true or false. If it's true, you're a strong agnostic. If it's weak, you're, uh, if it's false, you're a weak agnostic. But again, that's only sometimes how that, position, that proposition is utilized. When people say agnosticism only deals with knowledge, they're wrong. It can deal with knowledge in that epistemological propositional sense. But that's not how it's often used in the literature. So how, it is, how is it used, Steve, in the literature mostly? Well, it's used like this. Number three, modern usage of the word agnosticism is merely the belief that one is not justified to say, to say um, they, or assign a truth value to, to T or F where P equals one, at least one God exists, theism. It is this usage of the, uh, the person has attempted to evaluate the proposition believes but believes that they do not have sufficient justification to say that P is true or false. And they therefore are suspending judgment on P. In this context, it is the psychological state as opposed to the normative epistemological principle or epistemological proposition of being agnostic on pre P or agnostic on the proposition. Or someone who has tried to evaluate the proposition but does not believe that P is true and does not believe P is false. This is agnosticism throughout literature. Almost every time you see that word agnosticism, this is going to be how it's going to be used. So when somebody says, well, I'm an agnostic, they're telling you, I have not made up my mind to whether God exists, nor have I made up to my mind that God does not exist. So when people tell me, this is this again, this will back to my very first page or two where I say what my arguments are and what they are not. Let me be very clear on this. If you have one takeaway from, the, from this, please take this away. Agnosticism is not, nor ever has been, the middle ground between belief and not belief. No one that should ever argue that it is. It is, however, the middle ground between belief and believes not. So it is the middle ground between the belief that God does not exist and the belief that God does exist. That's the middle ground position. That is the third position. So when people say agnosticism is not a third position, they are fundamentally, material fact-wise, incorrect. Moving on. One way to demonstrate this is by um, Alex Malpass's wonderful use of reason blog. Um, this is his material. Uh, one viable view given by agnostic, or of agnosticism given by Dr. Malpass is view two on his use of reason blog. This view seems most consistent with Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy in that the agnostic holds to not be P and not be not P, which is I do not believe the proposition is true and I do not believe the proposition is false and is the middle ground between atheist and theist, BP and not BP. Now, if you look very carefully on this, this uh, diagram here, you'll see that there's no overlap. In this particular view, which is one of a couple of views he has, he does have a view that allows for a different view, such as agnostic theist and agnostic atheist, which is a completely separate video than this, I assure you. But in this particular view, there's no such thing as agnostic atheist or an agnostic theist. The agnostic is somebody who says, I do not believe P is true, and I do not believe P is false. And I don't know if you see my mouse, but believes P would be a theist, which is anybody who is significantly greater than 0.5. 
right? This is where I think Dawkins goes wrong. Dawkins tries to tell people that agnostic is either somebody, uh, is somebody who's 50, 50. I do not believe that. Um, and in this view, Dr. Malpast did not believe that. Uh, he puts himself this little gr green arrow, right? So he would say, well, he's somewhere down here and I would probably be in the same position right about here, but it still falls in agnostic. So as you go greater to the probability of one, which is your certainty, right? Again, knowledge does not require certainty. That's called the strong case of knowledge. Typically speaking, knowledge only call it requires certain conditions as set forth by justified true belief or some other theory of knowledge where the proposition is true, the subject believes the proposition, and the subject is justified to believe the proposition. So if you know P, what does that mean? It means you're entailing that you believe P. You cannot get to one, and again, I don't know if you're seeing my mouse here, but if you can, if you if you know P with a, with a certainty of one, you also believe P. This is why knowledge is a subset of belief. I've had people grossly incorrect argue to me that belief is a subset of knowledge. That is incorrect. That is not found in any theory of knowledge. And if I challenge you, for anybody who says the belief is a theory is a subset of knowledge, to explain to you using a Venn diagram and a theory out there that you can go reference, right? Now, this has a single axial approach, as you can tell. Now, there is a dual axial model out there. That dual model, however, is this epistemologically flawed. It has an error to it, much like the square of opposition had an issue with it. I'm not going to get into the, the details with the, the problems with the epistemological approach from a multi-axial approach, but this is why Dr. Malpass chooses to use a single axial approach. Uh, because as even uh, some very prevalent atheists has pointed out, things like agnostic, agnostic atheist in the weak case, that quadrant, is epistemologically unsound. It is nonsensical. That means that whole diagram is all nonsensical because it is all or nothing. Either the diagram has to make sense completely. If anything is wrong with it, then it cannot be a viable diagram. In that particular case, agnostic, agnostic atheism in the weak case is nonsensical. Okay. But I'm not going to give that, that this, but I'm not going to get into that, that particular um, time right now. I might do that in another presentation. But if you want to go read my blog, it's on there, www.greatdebatecommunity.com. Go find it. I have three entries on it, and uh, it'll explain to you in great detail. All right, moving on. Uh, this is a reductio ad absurdum. What a reductio ad absurdum is, is basically something that wants to show a contradiction or that something is absurd. I find this to be an absurd argument. I do not think this is a sound argument. It is valid. It is logically valid. Um, you can go check it in a logic checker. The valid, the, the, the logic is, is good. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details of what it means by valid and solid, uh, assuming valid and sound, unless you really want me to when this presentation is over. But this is what it would mean if you say that all non theists are atheists without any other you know, qualifiers or whatever. I'm not going to get into the conditionals. But if you just say any non theist is an atheist, this is what happens. So let me follow you. Follow the logic here. Um, by the way, please let me know if you can still see this, people. I get worried um, when I'm this far into the presentation. So given the submission that... Uh, please let me know in the live chat. Not uh, uh, if, you're message, if you're messaging me, I, I can't read your message. So message me in the live chat. Um, Given the submission that atheism equals not theist for synonymous terms, rather meaning that they're equal, that, that you can substitute one for the other. This would be a case like saying one equals 0.5. Excuse me, ha one half equals 0.5. There's an equality there, right? They're extensionally the same, but they're not intentionally the same. The reason being is that one half is a fractional notation, 0.5 is a decimal notation. So if I was to say something along the lines of, 0.5 is decimal notation, and I replace that with one half, I get one half is decimal notation. There's a problem there because that changes the proposition. That's called an intentionality issue. Extensionality, meaning their values are the same. So this gives us some very complicated understanding of propositional logic. But if you're going to suggest that they are intentionality the same here, then this is what happens, right? One, P1. And, and you know what? This I will look at the live chat because i really want people to understand this if you have any issues with the propositions please tell me now as we go along proposition one 
a premise one, A or not A, this is called the law of excluded middle. This is how it'd be in classical logic. Does anybody not accept premise one? Um, and also, uh, maybe my, one of my mods can go along with it. Uh, Lucifer Almighty or Tom Tom, uh, please follow along with me here. Do you accept premise one? I know there's a little time delay, so please forgive me. Not accepted. Okay, well, somebody says, uh, so Ralph Ellis in the live chat says, not accepted. He is actually saying at this point, classical logic is wrong. There's, I don't know of any other argument for that. Um, it's a tautology. A or not A is a tautology. It is the case by law exclude the middle that premise one must be true because it is a tautology. If you think premise one is wrong, you are saying logic is wrong. So um, Tom Tom knows logic. Tom Tom, I'm going to ask you, do you agree with that? That that this is a tautology. It must be wrong by logical definitions for classical logic. There's no other case to be had. And I'm going to move on to premise two. And if Ralph Ellis wants to argue with, with somebody else, that's fine. But he is saying at this point, classical logic is wrong. Okay. So premise two, theist or not theist. This is a simple instantiation. This is taking that A and I'm instantiating with something else. I'm saying A represents theist, not A represents not theist. Okay. So at this point, I have a dichotomy. It is the case that someone is a theist or it is not the case that someone is a theist. Tom Tom who is a mod in my live chat for people who watch this later on Atheist Edge. It is a case that Tom Tom is a theist, or it is not the case of theism. Uh, uh, it is not the case that Tom Tom is a theist. Uh, so Tom Tom, do you accept premise two? I have a couple of people saying not, but the problem is I can't get to everybody because they might be just po. Um, because again, if you think that premise two is wrong, you're literally saying that logic is wrong. Which somebody actually did in the live chat. They're like, logic is wrong, Steve. Um, well, my, my thing is this. if you, it's, I've actually, it's funny. I've actually had the atheist argue to me that, yeah, logic isn't always give you uh, correct conclusions, even if you're valid and sound. Well, the, there's some issues with that. If you're going to argue that classical log is, logic is wrong, such that even the law of school in the middle is wrong, and I'm not going to argue from Aristotelian point of view, where he may not accept law of school in the middle in non-classical logic, which we'd call paraconsistent logic. That's a different situation. But if you're arguing classical logic that law of exclusion in the middle is not tautology, then you're just fundamentally wrong, right? All right, so we got we got my mods accepting. Good, good to go here. Whew, you guys are scaring me here, like pulling teeth. Uh, all right, so premise three. This is an assertion. This is, okay, rocks are not theist. Now, the reason why this is simply an assertion is because if you have a dichotomy that if all things have to fall into one thing or the other, you have they're jointly exhaustive and mutually exclusive, right? So anything that's not in one case must be in the other. Rocks are not theist. So because they're jointly exhaustive and mutually exclusive, the only other position they can have is not theist, right? It's just a, it's just a def at this case, I hate to say it, it is a default. If they're not theist, they have to be not theist. All things that are not theist are not theist. That's not a psychological thing. That's why these are, we're not talking about psychological positions, right? It's not a requirement for rocks to have any non-psychological position, right? It's just, it's just required that rocks aren't theists. That's the only condition to be not theist. Be that's it. That's the only condition. It has nothing to do with beliefs, right? Because rocks can't hold a belief, right? So they cannot be a theist. Because they can't be a theist, they must be non-theist. That's it. So that's an assertion. Does everybody accept that? Yeah, no, and I agree with Tom. Tom, uh, P three is a definition that your interlocker has to agree upon. Absolutely, but if they hold that to be the case, then that then we we can continue. If they don't, they need to tell me what category rocks are in. It's either the case of they're theist or not theist. If they deny premise three, then they need to tell me which one of those two categories they believe it's in. Right. So moving on, because if they can't tell me which of the two, then I assume they have no problem with premise three. Number uh, premise four, uh, atheism equals not theism. This is the assertion part. Now, this is, I will tell you right here and now, this is the part that I reject, right? Premise one, true. Premise two, true. Premise three, true. Premise four, false. This is what makes this argument unsound to me. However, 
if you're one of those people, this is what the, the term rock atheist comes from. If you're one of those people that insist that anything that's not theist is an atheist, then this that proposition there, they need to accept. So this is where we kind of diverge here. Okay. So if you don't accept that, then great. Then you agree that all things that are not theist are not atheist. You're agreeing at this point that um it, is the PowerPoint fuzzy? Somebody says it's fuzzy. Can you guys read that? It shouldn't be. If it is, it's on your end, I think. Um, so at this point, this is where their logic fails or their reasoning fails by saying, well, if you're, you're, you know, if you don't believe in God, you must be an atheist. Well, no, unfortunately, that's not the case. Unless you hold to this, right? If you hold to this P4, it's true. Okay, fair enough. Let's continue. I reject P4. Then the conclusion would be rocks are atheist. Now, there are people in our community that actually have argued this. There are people in the community for a long-standing period of time. I wasn't going to use any names in this particular um, hangout, but I think this one's appropriate. But Because if you go look at their history, Bionic Dance is one of those people that argues rocks are atheist. And actually, I will give her props. She's logically consistent to do so, right? Because if she holds that premise 1, 2, 3, and 4 are true, which she does, then conclusion must follow if it's logically valid and sound. This is a logically valid argument. I guarantee that. But if all the premises are true, then it has to be sound. So she actually has to hold the conclusion to be true because she holds before they're true. I'm going to give her props that she's logically consistent. Okay. However, I think it's an absurdity. This is why we call it a reductio ad absurdum to say rocks are atheist. Right. There are atheists out there now that agree with me on that. They're like, of course, rocks are not atheists. That's stupid. I agree with you. But if you accept these premises, that is a logical necessary necessary logical consequence right uh clockwork rex asks do, do rocks have a brain or nervous system well i think you can answer your own question on that rex um if you can ask me questions come on uh, ask me about the presentation don't ask me any silly questions like do rocks have a brain uh, if you don't know the answer to that yourself then there's a problem rex um okay so moving on um I, I, and i will do a q a after this but it's going to be a separate video okay because we're already running over time and i want this to be one chunk. Uh, formally, rocks, all rocks are non-theist. I put the actual um, formal logic, and I know a lot of people might get scared of that. Don't be. It's not as, as hard as you may think it is, although it gets hard really quickly. Trust me. But this all this is saying for all of X, then any R implies N. So all rocks are non-theist. All non-theist are atheist. All rocks are atheist. As simple as that. If you think that's wrong, you can go you know, ask somebody who knows logic. But it's called it's a very simple uh, type of approach to logic. So um, I find the conclusion of this logical argument to be unsound because I reject premise four and I reject the conclusion. This is critical because the, the conclusion can be true with the premise being false. That's called the fallacy fallacy. If you say that the conclusion is untrue because it doesn't follow from the argument, that's that's not a valid counter argument. It could be the case that rocks are atheist, even if all the premises are false. But I don't hold that rocks are atheist, so I, I hold that P4 and C are not true. Okay, so moving on. So the next error I want to point out is the category error. Uh, the category goes along something along the lines of this. Premise one. Theological cognitivism is a non-cognitivism position. What I mean by that is a theological and cognitivist is somebody who says that all God talk is meaningless, including the propositional God talk. So if I say the proposition God exists, they will say that's not a proposition. It expresses nothing to be evaluated. It expresses nothing that can be true nor false. It doesn't even express anything that cannot be false. It expresses absolutely nothing that can be evaluated in any way. So you cannot be a theist. You cannot be a not theist. You can be you. All that is meaningless garbage to them. Right. So when we say non cognitivism, it doesn't mean that we cannot think about it. What it means is that it's not propositionally truth apt. Premise two atheism is a cognitivist position. What that is meant by that is not that you can hold a psychological position. What it's meant by is you can be represented by not PP or B not P. It can be represented as I do not believe the proposition or I believe the proposition is false. The reason that is cognitive is because now you have a proposition. And you're saying that proposition is evaluatable. Okay. Uh, conclusion, theological and cognitivism cannot be atheism. So you have a category error here. 
Because what you're trying to do is you're taking a non-cognitivist position and you're shoving it into a cognitivist position. This presents a problem. It nullifies a theological and cognitivist position. It just basically says, you know what? Uh, we don't care what you, your actual beliefs are for your, your positions, theological and cognitivist. We're going to shoehorn you into this position either way anyways and create a category error. Some might even argue a contradiction. So, all right. So moving on. Um, rebuttals. We're almost done here, people. Hold off. Um, rebuttals to criticisms. And while I'm doing this, please let me know if I do a QA, and a um, do you want me to do it by letting people in, call in, or just answer the live chat? I prefer to do just the live chat. It's getting late, but it's up to you. Rebuttals to criticisms. Um, although uh, this was actually from Draper, um, although Flew's definition of atheism fails as an umbrella term, it is a, certainly a legitimate definition in the sense that it reports how a significant number of people use that term. Again, there is more than one, quote, correct definition of atheism. I'm going to pause here because I agree with him so hardly. Anytime you ever hear anybody in the history of YouTube or in the perpetuity ever see hear them say steve argues only one definition of atheism is correct you have them come watch this video you have them come watch my channel that has never happened i've never argued there's only one definition there are channels out there have multiple videos against me arguing the one true definition of atheism right that's idiotic uh, i've never argued any such thing they've argued that there's only one true definition i've had atheists argue to me steve atheism is one thing uh, lack of belief, American atheists argue that, certain other atheist groups argue that. That is the only correct definition. That is their argument. That is not mine. So your your uh, rebuttal to me is actually a rebuttal to them. So moving on. The the issue for philosophy, uh, so the issue for philosophy is which, we def which definition is the most useful for scholarly or more narrowly philosophical purposes. In other contexts, of course, the issue is how to define atheism or atheist may look very different. For example, in some contexts, the crucial issue may be which definition of atheism as opposed to the athe atheist as opposed to atheism is more useful politically, especially in light of the bigotry that is some or for, to me bigotry that those who identify as atheists faced. Pause. That is very true. I grant that the stigma of atheism exists. I grant that I think that the, 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 the term atheism needs to be normalized, right? And I understand people's argument about why they want to take the atheist label, regardless of definitions, only because they want to reduce that stigma. And they want to do it, quote, politically. I, however, have, have people argued with me saying that I am a conspiracist, that there's no political agenda out there. That is absolutely incorrect. David Silverman argues this because he wrote this in Fighting God. He wrote that it is a political thing because that is his argument. He has said this in Hangouts online, that these are political things. So this is not anything new out there. These are political agendas. That's not an argument. That's not something to be worried about. That is an understandable position, that they want political power. Unfortunately, they throw away proper philosophical understandings by doing so and worse they tell people who are wrong for holding to proper proper philosophical context i am told i'm wrong for actually being correct as far as the philosophy that is unacceptable completely unacceptable uh the fact that there are strength in numbers may recommend a very inclusive definition of atheism that brings anyone who is not a theist into the fold he's right on that having said that one would think that it would further no good cause politically or otherwise, to attack fellow non-theists, moi, me, who do not identify as atheists simply because they choose to use the term atheist in some other equally legitimate sense. I use the term atheism or atheist as best understood by, the, by philosophy, which is expressly stated in all the sort of citational evidence that I have. But I am attacked by this. I am attacked by atheists who tell me that I'm wrong, that if I do not believe in God, I must be an atheist, which is logically wrong and philosophically wrong. But they do so anyways. And even Draper notes this. He actually says it furthers no good cause to do this. And he's absolutely right. Next slide. Uh, this is the end. I don't know why I put end backwards there. Um, 
Okay, whatever. Got to have some mistakes in here. But this is the end. Yeah, really, that's it. Yes, I'm telling you, dude, just go with it. Uh, if you accept this, great. If you don't, there's nothing else I can really tell you. Please go talk to an expert. Please go talk to an actual philosopher. Please go talk to a logistician. I've had people tell me, well, Steve, I've talked to a philosopher, and they say you're wrong. Great. Bring them to me. Do you know how many people have ever brought to me a philosopher that has ever said I'm wrong? Zero. So good luck with that. But if you have one, please, 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 I give you full, full, my full permission. Give them all my contact information. Come to bring my, my attention. I will bring 10 that disagree with them. Um, so I'm going to leave you with two quotes that I really like. Uh, and then I'm going to end this particular video. And I'm going to start a Q&A about five minutes afterwards. Please stick around. But if you don't, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that you took the time to watch this. It ran much longer than I expected. I expected a half hour. It lasted a full hour. Oh, well. Um, but two full quotes to leave you before I go. Quote, I do not believe in God and I'm not an atheist. Al Al for, uh, Albert Camus in Notebook. Uh, that's my position. I do not believe in God and I'm not an atheist. Also, an atheist is one who denies the existence of a personal transcendent creator of the universe rather than one who simply lives life without reference to such being. Robert, e, uh, Robert Lee, uh, I think it pronounces his name, Poitavin. Poitavin, or something along those lines. Please forgive me if I butcher that. But it is somebody who denies the existence of God. Denial meaning that the belief that God does not exist, not just merely not accept. But so anyways, I want to thank you all for watching this. I want to thank my mods. I want to again, thanks Atheist Edge, especially, who has been a wonderful channel to me. I think they hit 5,000 subs not long ago. I was on their 5,000 sub um, uh, stream. They are amazing. Go check them out. And I hope this video gets uploaded to their channel and they, they put some bumper stuff on it and people can actually um, glean something out of this. It means a lot to me that I have such a following. It means such an a, amazing amount to me that people take the time to listen to me and try to understand my arguments. And, the, and if they even still disagree with me, you know what? I'm happy they even listened. So I'm going to stop sharing this. I'm going to end the uh, hangout and I'll start a Q&A here very shortly so you guys can help. Um, maybe suss out the things that I missed and answer questions. And with that, good night.